really excited to be here with you guys. And let's actually give it up for Dave. I mean, what an intimate setting, perfect setting to do this. Thank you, Dave. I mean, this, this couldn't be any, any uh, more perfect of a night to spend with all of you guys. And uh, I'm Byron Lazine. If you don't know me, there's two things I really want to talk to everyone about tonight. And the first thing is going to be marketing and media generation versus the sales skills that we're consistently training on and trying to get better at. But if we were going to only choose one this year, and Dave just alluded to it, in this changing market in 2023 when things are gonna be dramatically different than the last two years, which one are we gonna push the chips into? The marketing and media generation or those sales skills? So I wanna talk on that as well as what is going to be um, your mindset around, hold on, I just fucked everything up completely. <laughs> no, the, the thing that I actually do a bunch, just completely fucked that up, but um, the, clip, the clips that you see on social, the short form content becoming a clip machine. So that's gonna be the second part that I talk about but how many, just by a show of hands, how many people were in the business, so I just understand the context of the room, before 2008? A lot of people, that's awesome, that's very impressive. And then how many people got in right after 2008? So you've been in it like 2012, that time frame on. And then how many just the last two years, the, the pandemic, all right? So for those in the room that have been in real estate in 2008, that time frame, you understand the type of market that we're heading into right now. The biggest fuck up in my life is not the one that I just made right here talking to all of you. It's actually what I did in 2004, 2005, 2006. 2004, I was 19 years old and I bought my first piece of real estate at the height of that market, the mortgage crisis. I had a friend who was a lender and I was like, hey, get me a loan, even though I probably really couldn't even afford it, right? And I bought three homes from 19 to 21 in the worst locations you probably could buy in without knowing any skills around how to rent these properties out, how to manage the properties, how to construct a deal. I had four mortgages on three properties. And when everything went to shit in 2008, so did my little dream of being, becoming this real estate investor. Back then, when it was cool to be called a mini Trump, that's what all my friends were calling me. Right now, it, you know, if you say that, you're probably going to go run and hide and be like, no, that's not me. Nobody's talking uh, about me in that, in that way, right? But I was just buying properties and didn't know what I was doing. And so when everything fell apart, I went completely bankrupt by my mid-20s by trying to do real estate without having the knowledge, right? Without understanding what I was supposed to be doing in that market, in that time frame, And right now we all have the advantage of understanding where we are, understanding that, yeah, we're going into a shifting market and there's going to be less transactions, but how are we going to give ourselves enough at bats? And so when I got into real estate sales in 2012, which for me in Connecticut was the lowest point of the market, for that market. It, it was the worst time to be getting into real estate according to everybody. Everybody was getting out of real estate. Everybody was on their way out, the part-timers, and you see that right now, right? The people who had it easy the last couple of years, they're going right now and figuring out how to get a job because it hasn't been as easy right now in terms of how many transactions there are to go around. And that's what was happening in 2012. There was absolutely no buyers. And so I got in in that time frame. And I think right now, as we look at 2023, we have the opportunity. I think it's the best time to actually build something special when everybody's getting out, when things are a little bit harder. And from 2012 to today, my team in Connecticut has grown to over 50 agents and we're going to do, I don't know, 750 transactions for over 300 million. So what we can all accomplish in a decade is incredible. Right, so whether you're just starting out, you've been in it since 2008, you wanna restart your business, wherever you are, you have the best opportunity in 2023 that you've ever had 
to push the chips into the middle on what I'm calling the marketing and media generation of your business. Sales skills are very important, but think about the last two years. Think about the number one lead generator the last two years. What was it? It was Zillow, right? And if you were on one of these mega teams, like, the, like mine that I just mentioned, and maybe you didn't have, maybe you were brand new, maybe you didn't have the sales skills of so many of you that raised your hand that have been in it since before 2008, you could still do 24, 35, 40 deals, even if you didn't have the sales skills. Why could you do that? Because Zillow gave you the at-bats that nobody else had. Zillow gave you more opportunities, and that's a marketing machine, right? That's generating these leads, and they're calling a trusted brand. They're calling Zillow and saying, I wanna see 123 Main Street at seven o'clock. And an agent showing up, and they're like, great, I'm excited about the house more than I am researching agents, right? That's the mindset of a buyer. I'm excited about homes, I'm, I'm scrolling on homes, I'm looking at homes, I'm sharing homes with my partner, sharing out homes with my spouse, and that's what ultimately what I wanna do, that's my goal. I wanna accomplish that goal. And so whether you've got the skills of a, it's funny, I was just spending the morning today up in Newport Beach with Tim Smith, and I asked him this question, what's more important, Tim? Is it marketing or is it the sales skills? And his answer was sales skills, I figured it would be. And when you're selling $45 million homes and you have a big Rolodex and you're persuading people into paying five million more than they want to, sales skills are gonna be ultra important. And they're still ultra important for everybody in this room. I believe in role playing, we do it every single day. I'm not trying to steer you away from having skills and knowledge, absolutely critical. But if I'm going all in and spending 80% of my time on something, it's how do I become the Zillow of my community? How do I start generating lead over lead over opportunity over opportunity where I have the biggest database in my market and it's not even a question? Where I have more at-bats than anybody else in my market and that's how you're gonna beat the 35-year vet if you're somebody that just started in the last two years. It's what I did when I started in 2012 when everybody was getting out. The only deals were being done by 35-year agents and in 2012 they were still in Connecticut where they're really behind the times, they were still listing everything in the newspaper, right? They were making sure they were on the front page of the real estate section in the New London Day, one of the oldest papers in America today, every single week. That was their pitch. That's how they were staying out in front of everybody. And in 2012, I said, I'm gonna generate more opportunities than they are by getting myself out there, by getting on YouTube early, by getting on Facebook early. I love what Katie said in here where she said, don't worry about the vanity that everybody's talking about, like doing the funny skit because you know it really works for the views. I was putting out really boring information that I cared about, but it was community driven. It was information on the market that I knew if I got it in front of the right person, it was going to hit. And I'm thinking about a YouTube channel right now that doesn't even exist anymore, but it brought me my first new development because the sisters of the developer saw this video and it was a short form video back in 2013, 14 timeframe. It was only eight minutes long, right? When everything on YouTube was fairly long, but they shared it with their brother who, had, who was a developer who had a 76 lot home division and he had 67 of the 76 homes already sold. So there was nine homes left. The agent on this deal was a Coldwell Banker agent who had worked with him and his family, because his father owned the development business first, for 20 years. Well, they had hit a rough patch and they hadn't sold anything in 12 months. The market, the marketing, all of that combined. The sister saw this one YouTube video, which literally probably had 12 views on it, and they shared it with their brother over email. He called me in and he said, I just wanna pick your brain. I see social media, you know, I'm hearing about Facebook, I'm hearing about all these things, and I've gotta sell these last nine lots. That's where, if you do new development, that's where the developer makes their money, right? At the end, we know that's where they make their money. The beginning, they're taking all the risk, and there's a lot of stress when you get to the end, especially if you're not converting on the timeline that you thought you would convert at. So he wanted to come in and pick, wanted me to come in and pick my brain. Well, what did I get? 
I got an opportunity to sit down in his spec home and sit with him face to face. And yeah, absolutely, that's where your skills are going to become ultra important. But it's also where your authenticity is gonna come out, right? You fuck up like I did, you just own it and you, and you move forward. I would, my style was I'm gonna just open up the MLS, which nobody does because everybody's bringing glossy flyers and big presentations and all this bullshit that's just gonna gloss their eyes over. And I'm just gonna walk you through the MLS and I'm gonna let you play around with it, right? It's not a hidden thing. I'm gonna let you get behind the scenes and let's talk about the numbers, let's talk about the data. But with him, because he was captured by the video, I really wanted to talk about how we're going to sell these last nine homes by doing what I just did to get in front of you. And I'm gonna get more buyers to come through these properties, to come through the open houses by producing this level of content, by producing weekly content for your deal. And I made the confident promise and then delivered on it and started producing content for them over and over and over again. And of course we sold those last nine lots and of course it led me to other new development deals. Another thing, just thinking about it this morning that Tim said, it's like, why are we creating that type of video? Like, like Katie mentioned, the vanity videos and not creating content now that we can talk about on the next listing, right? So the next time I met with a developer, the story I just told you, I was able to tell him. I was able to tell him how many videos we produced what a rough patch he had for two years selling one home in 18 months. And then we came in and we sold the last nine homes in less than two years. And here's the videos that we produced to do it. And here's how we sent out the videos to prospective buyers. Here's how we built an email list and kept that email list warm on all the video content that we were creating. That's so much more valuable than doing a TikTok dance and getting a, you know, a million views on TikTok. And we're gonna talk about short form here in just a second, but I wanna be able to tell stories on my listing presentation. I wanna be able to name drop deals that I've done in the past to be able to convert on that next deal. And that's where this stuff, become, becoming the marketing machine, the lead generation machine through your media content becomes so important so that when you go to the next deal, you have another piece of your portfolio to talk about. I've done this, I've done this, this is how this is going to work for you. So be thinking about whether you're, an, how many single agents? So less than half, just solo agents. Even for the single agents, be thinking about how I'm going to build a media team around me. I would argue that every single agent here is already a team. You have a photographer, you have somebody editing those photos, Maybe you have somebody editing your video. So how are you going to start to build a little media team around you? If you're doing the editing of the video like I did in the very beginning, even if you're great at it, like Chris is phenomenal video editor, you need to stop yesterday. It is such a time suck. Video editing is going to take you, and Chris is shaking his head, and he's an artist. He's a true talent at it. I was terrible at it but it's gonna take you so many hours. And if you really care about the end product like Chris does, it's gonna take you even longer, right? Cause you wanna perfect it and you really care about it. You need to outsource this stuff immediately. Video editing, video production, the writing. I've, I stopped writing listing descriptions at least three or four years before I fully stepped out of production and just led the team. Because even if a, even if a listing description takes you 10 minutes because you're really good at it, that's 10 minutes you're not on the phone with a client. That's 10 minutes you're not replying to a DM that's sitting there and it could be a referral. And trust me, if you're we've all been there, if you're 24 hours late on responding to a referral, they got nervous because the other side's waiting for the introduction to the agent and they went and found somebody else. These are the actions we need to be taking to make money. We need to be on appointments, we need to be signing listing contracts, right? We need to be signing buyers. We need to be reacting to the leads that are coming in. We need enough leads coming in where we're running to every single direction and we don't even have time to worry about the transaction department or the video editing or the writing. So start to think about this like a media company. It's, it's the big move I made probably five or six years ago in building the team. 
instead of five or six years ago, I wasn't buying Zillow leads like everybody was. I wasn't in on the gold rush of buying zip codes. I'm doing the premier agent stuff now because we have such a big team and they switched over to the referral game. But when it was, let's go spend $100,000 on zip codes and own this, I was investing in building the media team. I was doing it all backwards so that when I got to the point where I wanted to dip into Zillow, I already had the writer in place. I already had the graphic designer. I already had the video producer. I already had the editor, right? And I would encourage you all as we go into 2023 to think about doing just that in your business. Think about investing and going, making the decision to go all in in a way where you really invest in that infrastructure so that you're known at the most ridiculous level in your community. And so that leads me into this short form content. And if anybody in this room even does know me, that's likely where you know me from right now today is a TikTok or an Instagram reel that you've seen. Right now, we all have, and Gary V is the one screaming this at the rooftops, we all have the most opportunistic point in our social media game than we've ever had before. He calls it the TikTokification of social media. When we look at YouTube shorts specifically, Instagram reels, and TikTok videos, these 10 to 90 second short form videos that the three platforms are pushing organically to a level we've never seen before. So when you think about who's got the biggest accounts that you're competing with, or who's naturally always gotten the most views or the most comments, it's because they had the biggest following and it's because the algorithm pushed their content in front of their following. And if you have a smaller following, your views did less than theirs. Your engagement, your reach was at a much smaller level. Now that doesn't matter at all. You can have an account like the broke agent at 400,000 views and do well, or you can have an account with four followers and get more views if you have the right piece of content. And this is what we figured out at Broke Agent Media in the real estate space better than anybody is right now is the time to go all in on these short clips. I don't have the biggest following in real estate, but I just had the most viral short form video of the entire year of anybody that does real estate podcasting. When I had Glenda on the Byron Lazine podcast, she dropped a brilliant line. We set that as the hook. The hook is your three seconds at the beginning of the video. We edit it, and this is what we're really doing right at BAM, is we're editing out any dead spaces, putting engaging graphics on these short clips so that people stay in the loop and watch it two, three, four times. So it tells the algorithm that this is a very uh, attractive video for the audience. We need to serve it up to more people. This video went over 17 million views between TikTok and Instagram Reels. Dave Ramsey picked it up and talked about it. You can't get that type of PR getting on Dave Ramsey's show without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. The fact that Dave Ramsey picked it up and did a 10 minute segment on this one clip, there's no way I could get media placement any other way. By the way, the next video I posted on TikTok did 300 views because the content wasn't as good as that one. But in any other year, I would have ne everything would have been 300 views, 400 views, 1,000 views, 2,000 views. When you hit on great content right now, it is going to go extremely viral. In that time frame, that one week where we did the 17 million views, I probably picked up over 40,000 followers between Instagram and TikTok together. So do we want 40,000 more followers to generate a message, generate a CTA for more referrals, for more leads into our community? And I would argue that everybody, every single person sitting here right now has somebody in their community that is a local Glenda Baker. Glenda Baker is a natural clip machine. Taya DiCarlo is a natural clip machine. When you line 
her up with the right question and you present it in a way on a podcast for her to deliver the answer, she's typically going to deliver it where those first three seconds are very divisive or they're attention grabbing. There is a way you want to speak to the audience in the first three seconds to keep them on the video. And I guarantee everybody has somebody in their community just like that. Whether they're a teacher, whether they're a 40 year restaurant owner who's authentic, maybe an immigrant, who's worked their butt off to get to where they are and they speak their mind. Going and doing your interview, your long form content with the sole purpose of generating four to five clips is the game right now. And when I say generating four to five clips, I'm going back to how we're asking the question, how we're framing up the conversation to get them to give the answer. So if, let's just use that example, if it's the 40 year restaurant owner who is bombastic, who's just very outspoken in the community, I might say, and, if, and let's just use uh, the name Eric Simon because it is top of mind for me right now. If I'm Eric Simon and there's one thing I could change about the community, what is it? Right? So I want to use their name if they're known in the community in the question as if I was a news reporter. If Eric Simon, who's been here 40 years, could change one thing in the community, what would you do? Boom. He's probably going to answer that question with the first thing I would change. What is this? San Juan? Is that how you say this? San Juan? No? All right. First thing I would do to change San Juan in my 40 years of experience, boom. Anybody from San Juan who hears that as the hook is going to wait on the video. What is the first thing this guy who's been here 40 years would do to change? You want to get whoever you're talking to in your long form content to give you an answer in that form without giving them the script. So it's up to you to ask the right questions, which means you've got to be a great listener, which means you've got to really think about how you're going to frame the question to them before you ask them the question. Because when you get two or three great hooks out of whoever you're talking to in your community, you're going to be able to go back and chop them up into these 30, 45, 60 second clips that are perfect for YouTube shorts, that are perfect for Instagram reels, that are perfect for TikTok, that could easily do 17 million views. Nobody knows who the fuck Glenda Baker is and we did 17 million views. In real estate, people know who she is, sure. But seven, there's not 17 million real estate agents out there, right? There's a couple million real estate agents. So who are the other 15 million people? They're just regular people. Somebody who's on my little league team hit me up on a DM. <laughs> this is a real story. Somebody on my little league team hit me up on a DM and said, dude, somebody from um, my squad in the military, I don't know if you call it squads, but somebody from the military sent me this clip of you and then you were on, like, it's just amazing where these things can go. And that starts what? A conversation. Hey, what are you up to? You still living tonight? Like, where? I hadn't talked to this guy literally since Little League. So it doesn't matter if it's the restaurant owner. Think Dave Portnoy, think Barstool Sports. How many restaurant owners have went completely viral from his content that just own a little pizza shop in Jersey or in New Haven or in Miami? Nobody knew who these people were before. They have lines out the door because of something funny they said, because of some engaging hook that they delivered when he showed up at their door and just holding a camera like that and, and just literally doing spur of the moment content. So when you leave here today, if you're actually gonna go all in on really getting known in your community, I want you to go all in on that. How am I going to every single day, every single week, get into the habit of creating long form conversations on camera that I can chop up to four, three, five, whatever it may be, clips every single week that are getting repurposed on those platforms that we spoke about? How can I systemize 
my content to go have these conversations? And how can I think outside of the box of just the restaurant? How can I maybe just engage people who live in the community regardless if they're buying or selling right now? Hey, I, I looked up online and I see that you've lived here for 45 years. And I'm shocked that we don't know each other because I pride myself in knowing everybody in the community. And yes, I'm Byron Lazine and I'm a real estate agent, but I'm not calling you to sell your house because you've been here 45 years. I can't imagine you would ever sell. I'm actually calling you to interview you about your experience living here in our community. And by the way, I want to learn from you how I can be a better ser servant to our community. And if you got that, maybe little old lady to agree to that interview, wouldn't that be maybe the best piece of content you could ever produce? Where that person is telling the story of how things have changed and how they've seen you know, their neighbors come and go and this person who accomplished something so great, nobody, nobody talks about you know, this person, they went to the minors and then they went to the big leagues, right? They're gonna have all this information and if you just spend an hour, two hours with them, put the camera on and start recording, you'll find two or three clips that go maybe not millions and millions viral, but viral in your community where more people know who the heck you are. And by the way, she's probably gonna go to tea and tell all her friends that, oh my gosh, this agent just came over, didn't try to sell my house, didn't try to sell me anything, but just wanted to talk to me. It was the coolest experience I've ever had in living here in 45 years. And we know what word of mouth does for our business. We know that referrals are always going to be our number one way to get and attract more business. But I promise you, your referrals go way up when you're top of mind every single day. And the best way to be on top of these algorithms that none of us can control and that change every day right now and going into 2023 is making sure you have a short clip up every single day. Don't worry about when you post. I've posted at two in the morning and videos have done great. I've posted at seven in the morning, they've done great. I've posted at lunchtime and they've done great. It's gonna come down to is the content good? Because I've posted at all those times and they've done nothing as well. So I don't get upset about a video that does nothing. I post another one the next day. It's the same thing how I started this talk where I'm talking about at bats, right? Talking about maybe the agent who doesn't have all the skills but goes on more Zillow appointments than you do. And what do they do? They end up selling more houses at the end of the year because they had more at bats. They had more face-to-face -face meetings with people who wanted to buy homes. And that's how you're actually gonna do a lot of business. You're going to get in front of more people. And if you don't wanna pay 35% to Z or an extra 35% on top of the team split, or you don't wanna to have to pay RDC or whoever the next lead generation platform is going to be, then become your own lead generation platform. Be more known than anybody in the market and your sales skills are gonna be something that you're gonna to continue to work on and there's no better way to work on them than being in front of more people over and over and over again. So I don't know how many of you guys are gonna do it, but I promise you this moment, because everybody is saying it, is going to pass. And in 2004, if you didn't actually walk away from this and decide to put up two clips a day or one clip a day in 2023, you're gonna say, man, I really wish I did it. Because now my parents are on TikTok and I never thought they would get there, <laughs> right? That's gonna happen. So don't get to where so many people got to an Instagram where they're like, man, everybody's left Facebook. They're now on Instagram. I don't have a following there and I'm playing catch up. You can actually all of a sudden for the first time in the last four or five years, catch up in a big way on Instagram. You can catch up in a big way on TikTok by putting out these short form videos by taking it from a long conversation and not worrying that the podcast did no views 
because you're doing it for the sole purpose of getting these short clips, of having thousands of people in your community see that clip and how cool that conversation was. So please, if you get nothing else out of what I've said tonight, really commit to making the decision. Go home, talk to your spouse, talk to your partner. Here's where I want my business to be. And I'm promising you, the people that in double and triple your biz their business in this market are gonna be the ones that create the most at-bats for themselves. Have the biggest brand in their market. Create content at a level where they have so many people talking about them when they're in their, while they're sleeping, right? The only way to have passive marketing is to be doing what we're talking about right now. So go have that conversation. Get the permission to make the decision to go all in on this. Are you gonna have to be out there on the weekends? You're damn right you're gonna have to be out there on the weekends in 2023. Are you gonna have to work evenings? Absolutely. This is going to be a harder market than the last two years. It's also the best time to go all in everywhere while most people are complaining about it. While most people are going to the path of least resistance, meaning everything's hard, my phone's not ringing like it used to, so mm, I'll just eat bad food and watch junk TV and I'll figure it out tomorrow. Have you ever been in that stage where you're like, I'll do that tomorrow, tomorrow becomes next week, becomes next month, and it never gets done, and then it's 2024, and you regret never doing it at all. Please, leave this today and start figuring out how to post clips each and every single day. I wanna go right into Q&A and answer questions on this. I think that's gonna be the best way we're gonna be able to really learn from each other, and hopefully you can get some more takeaways from that. So I appreciate you guys listening, not booing me the hell out of here as I screwed up at the beginning. And uh, let's get right into the Q&A, David. We've got a good question. Okay, so should the, the short clips be on your main profile page or should you be mixing in? Yeah, your page. Yep. Yeah, I think absolutely. Here's the thing. I think you I think especially how much are you posting a day? Or a week? How much are you posting a week? Okay. So three times. Three times on your main grid, right? Your Instagram grid we're talking about, and then there, there's obviously stories. I would definitely argue you should be doing more. Right, we're in agreement there. That's why you're here at Marketing Matters. Is that name for sale? Do you have you trademarked that by the way? Um, you definitely post more, and don't worry about like should I put it here? Put it absolutely everywhere. And then when you have so much content, you might pick and choose. Okay, like like we talk about this with our BAM content all the time. We'll post this sometimes on TikTok, but, but we have an abundance of content that we're pushing out there. And maybe it's not perfect for the Instagram. Post it everywhere, post it multiple times. If you believe you put out a really good clip and it just didn't hit, post it again in three days, post it again in three weeks, post it again in three months, repurpose it and it might hit the next time. If it does smash, post it again four or five times. How many episodes have Seinf of Seinfeld, the greatest show of all time, have you watched over and over and over again, right? Over and over and over again. If it's a great clip, you're gonna watch it over and over and over again. So just start posting more. There's a, there's a belief out there, it's funny, I'm bringing up a lot of the conversation I had with Tim this morning, but it's all top of mind. There's a belief out there that, like I'm gonna just try to create, it's a, like a disease running through the real estate industry. I'm just gonna to try to create these funny skits, the, the, these little funny videos. I'm gonna to try to be Eric. I'm gonna to try to be the broke agent to make people laugh. And that'll potentially bring me referrals. But I'm only gonna post it if it's really good. I'm only gonna post it once a week because it's gotta be great quality content. And then there's the belief that actually works, which is what I do. 
which is just post all the time. And if one thing hits a week, it's better than the person that's waiting three weeks for something to be perfect to post. I'm telling you right now, you're gonna learn a lot more by posting consistently. So just post everywhere, on the grid, on the story, on TikTok, and don't leave out YouTube shorts because YouTube is actually trying to compete with TikTok and they're gonna give you more organic views. So the question is, if you feel like you've got a great reel, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really crush, would you boost it? Would you put some ad spend behind it? I would not, okay? I mean, that 17 million um, clip view, by the way, I didn't even think that clip was going to do that good. But it was the one out of the group, I thought there was going to be another clip that did better. That was the one that took off, okay? So sometimes you don't know. Sometimes... You know, we talk about it all the time. This clip's going to crush it. It does nothing. This clip's garbage. It does, right? So we don't know until we test it. Once something does really, really good and it's shown you organically, it's an amazing clip. Now you can take it out and create a, a second version of that and run an ad with that clip. Okay? So if we're using the example that I gave, the 40 year you know, entrepreneur in the community and that clip just crushes organically, I might run an ad with that person, you know, targeting them to a link for some type of PDF I have about the community. Maybe if it's that restaurant owner, the top 10 restaurants you've never heard of in this, whatever, right? Download to collect emails and just use, whatever my game is that I'm trying to get on the ad. If I know that the clip works, I'll run an ad against it then. Yeah. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was there's a lot of trial and error. Absolutely. You're always A-B testing. So is, is there a certain trend that's working right now for clips? I will tell you, I've been doing clips from a podcast before they were ever cool. And they never did numbers. I just thought it was cool, right? So I was doing these little box clips on Instagram. I was setting it up like the ESPN, uh, putting like the categories on the right side and they would do nothing, right? I really want to stress that right now, no matter what you do, if you post most of multiple reels, shorts, and TikToks, they're going to do good. It's like the golden era. But one thing that's for sure, trend that's working, that you're seeing, and if you go on my Instagram or TikTok, you'll definitely see, is all of the editing overlays. So the most common DM I'm getting right now is what app are you using for the copy that's on top of the video? And it's not an app, it's, it's our editing team, right? But everybody's looking to just like upload and, and maybe in two years that will exist where there'll be some AI editing and you just upload an hour talk and they pick the best hooks and they, and they chop it up. But what's really working is editing it to keep people's attention. So selecting the best clip in the first three seconds, literally taking whoever you interviewed out of context if it's better for the clip. Literally, they said something amazing right here, that's their hook, then two minutes later, they actually got to A, B, and C of explaining the hook, the, the two minutes in between, I don't need. It was a bunch of filler, dead space. It works in a long form conversation and it makes sense there. People ramble on. I want to get down to A, B, and C so that it really works in the clip. So you take this part, mash it with that part, and then where maybe they finish their thought. And that comes down to editing. These clips, anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds, a really good clip is going to take your editor two hours. That's the industry standard right now. If you get an editor, they should be doing two hours a clip. Seems like a lot, lot of time, but all those text overlays, putting a photo on top, if they say the, you know, um, 
We're, we're here in California. So, so if they say the LA Rams, right? You want to show a visual of the LA Rams that's quick and, and all that editing takes time. So a really good editor can get four done in a day. Maybe somebody who needs a little bit more time, maybe they're two and a half hours, can get three done in a day. If they're only getting two clips done in a day, fire them and find someone that can get three to four because that's the industry standard right now. You're, you're gonna pay about $52,000 a year for that editor if they're working remotely, right? If they're working remotely, it's about $1,000 a week, each week to get anywhere from three to four done a day. And if you wanna hold them accountable to actually getting really good quality and not just finishing clip after clip, then maybe you bonus per view, right? You say, well, m my views are averaging 500 right now, so for every video that does 10,000 views, I'm gonna give you an extra $50 per video. So they wanna, cause then when they see those hits, like, oh, that was a nice little drip for me, another 50 bucks, another 100 bucks, whatever makes sense. And so that's a long answer to answer the question of, you need to outsource this to somebody else who can follow the, the, the theme that's working, which is a lot of editing overlays to keep people visually engaged, understanding the hook, cutting out the, the dead space, a jump cut, those types of tactical moves that an editor will make. You don't even need to know about it, right? Like exactly what they're doing. You need to show them the clips. This is what I need. I need the dead space out. I need a great hook. How many can you do in a day? The industry standards three to four. How much are you gonna charge? And maybe you start at one or two if it's a freelancer or something like that. My question is, is we're working with an editing team right now. We're letting our editing team watch our video, our long form content and extract reels from it. And we're not sure, do you sit with your editing team and say, hey, this is how I want your full content. Do you give them the creative flexibility to do it? How do we fine tune this relationship so we can get more out of the, the content that we're extracting? Yeah, so we are still trying a bunch of different ways on this. The, the real answer is we're always, testing it and it, it depends on the individual. So a unicorn editor would be somebody who naturally hears the clip when they listen to the interview, when they listen to that 20, 30, 40 minutes long form piece of content and they can pull that headline, that clip, that, that hook out that would lead the clip and edit it and write the copy on the post. So you're probably better off, you know, if you have a, a producer that's listening in real time, figuring out the timestamps. And then in the beginning, you're probably better off listening on 2x speed to that conversation. Or if you heard it in real time to like try to make a note of where that was so that you can give the editor the timestamp so that they can pull it out. There's going to be to create a clip that has a great hook at the beginning and keeps people engaged, there is going to be a heavy lift starting off. There's no question about it. If you really want it edited to keep people engaged, you're going to have to be an active participant in the content that's being selected. Eric with the BAM content over analyzes it every day, all day long, right? But that's what we're doing with Broke Agent Media. For your content, it might just come down to once a week sitting there listening to your 40 minute podcast on 2X speed for 20 minutes and helping the editor pick those headlines that are gonna be used as the hook at the beginning of your clip. So spend the 20, 30 minutes listening to it back each week, spend the hour actually producing it and outsource everything else. Cause what can be outsourced is the formula of the text overlay, the jump cut, the actual editing part, which takes hours, right? But don't outsource having good, what you imagine to be good quality content in the beginning. And then as you find people that can understand what we're looking for, show them uh, that content that's working, they'll start to get it, they'll, they'll learn more, they'll, they'll be able to pick it out Easier. I've always been somebody who was like against hiring young 
college kids for sure because they're usually very entitled. And it's like if you want to work and actually do something in your field of expertise, especially video editing, you sure as hell wouldn't go to college because they're not going to teach you anything. But I've changed in the last year, two years, because we've had a bunch of interns, uh, especially during COVID, we cleaned up on interns because they had cleaned up, meaning we had a lot of them for little investment because they had nothing to do. And what we're finding is some of the people that use these apps, college kids, TikTok, Instagram Reels, and are consuming this content can pick out those hooks and those headlines better than maybe somebody who's been in the marketing game for 10 or 15 years and is stuck in their box, if, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. My suggestion, whether you call it a podcast, uh, being the reporter of your community, you know, whatever you want to call it, have long document, you know, vlogs, whatever you want to call it, have long conversations, 20 minutes to 40 minutes to an hour for the sole purpose of extracting great 15, 30, 60, 90 second clips so that you have your four or five posts every single week. You can do face to camera, sitting down, creating clips and batching them up all day. I believe that getting somebody in your community that's pretty dynamic and some are gonna be more than others to deliver that headline for you and you being the person that is putting them on that stage that's producing that content is going to be even more valuable. And I do the face to camera stuff, but it's going to be more valuable than that. As you start to build up that library, the second step would be going face to camera, batching up 30 videos in a four hour time frame so that you have two posts a day. But when you're doing that, think about the clip and I would have somebody like Bobby does or some of like we have Ryan do it, some other um, video producers where they're saying, okay, what's the topic we're gonna talk about? And they actually give me two or three hooks to say at the beginning. So we'll record two or three hooks, right? At the beginning of the video, and then I'll just talk about it and then I'll close the video. But they're gonna pick now which two or three hooks and if one video uh, doesn't do well, we're just gonna use the one in two weeks when everybody forgot to post that video with the other hook. Alternate hooks. Question back. Byron, how much time do you spend or what's your process studying content and really putting yourself in the window and the knockout of that to be successful? So if it's like a podcast? No, like another form. Create 30 or 40 four hours, short form. Yes. Yeah, so really deep detail and really talk about Yeah, so 30, if it's 30 or 40 batch recorded videos we're talking about. There's going, if you're going to record for four hours, you're probably going to prepare for at least four hours. And, and really, we all know it's more than four hours because if I'm preparing for four hours, what am I preparing? Those 30 or 40 headlines that I'm going to talk about. But my experience in real estate has already given me the knowledge and the information of what I'm filling on my three bullet points underneath the headline, right? Think of all these little short form videos as like a three paragraph essay. I've got my hook, I've got the answer, and I've got my close, right? So the body, that, third, that second paragraph in a three paragraph essay, and the close are really what I know and do every single day. I've often said the easiest Q&A show to start is already sitting in your inbox. You can start a 52 week Q&A show by just looking up the last 52 questions that you've been asked. You already know the answers. Now the preparation time that Jason's talking about is putting all those questions together in a headline format, in what I keep calling a hook format so you can hook the audience in. And then literally the answer that you delivered in that email is the answer you give your second paragraph on how you're framing this video, 
Now you're giving it in a 15 second fashion or a 30 second, 60 second fashion, and it's being edited down to 15, 20 seconds, and then you're just gonna close. And you're gonna close in a way that is in, so if you're thinking about buying real estate, call me. No, 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 because now you're never gonna get somebody to watch the video again. You're gonna close in a way, so if you were in this situation, let me know what you would do, right? Because you wanna drive more comments. Our closes at the end of these batch recorded videos are to drive some type of engagement. So if you were me in this situation, how would you have handled that, right? Some type of question that leads them into the comment section. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you'll know as you do some, if you're doing like the interview, long form interview, how long's a, a long form, um, you'll know if the conversation's gotten, you know, nowhere, you know, and, and I, I, I can kind of tell if somebody's getting really commercially on me, you know, that's going to be, if you see the Byron Ozine podcast at 25 minutes, it's because they pitched themselves like four times in the first 15 minutes and I'm just going to cut it short. But if you're actually going to bring value you know, I don't know how, how long was the Tim Smith pod today? Like an hour. That was like an hour because he was just delivering value, stories, storytelling. And it's like, I'm engaged in that conversation. I, I want to be there. Um, so on an interview, it's really going to be as long as the content's good. If you're going to produce a show that is duplicatable each week, like I do with the Real Word podcast, it's, three, it's, it's usually about 25 to 30 minutes because we have a formula that we repeat. So anything you do, you want it to be a formula that you do over and over and over again. So that's a three segment show. It's literally headlines that have already be, been written during the week, so I don't have to think about them. What's trending in news, real estate news? What's the headline that they used? That's my hook at the top of the segment. What's my POV on that eight to 10 minute segment? What's the next headline? What's my POV on that? Eight to 10 minute segment. Next headline, my POV. Three segment show, about a half hour. Within those eight to 10 minute segments, I'm, when I know what I'm gonna say, when I know I'm gonna crush a certain little point, I go right into the camera and I deliver a hook and then I talk about the context behind the hook because I know they're gonna be able to clip that out. We have one, uh, what's the one today that's doing really well? Uh, don't marry the race. Yeah, don't. right, so we were talking about an article where you know everybody's saying this thing, don't marry, don't, don't, date, don't the date the rate. Yeah, don't, oh, date the rate, marry. What's the bullshit everybody keeps saying? You know what it is. Date the rate, marry the house. And it was in an article, right? And so I, when, we, when we read the headline of the article, I looked at the camera and I said, this is, I don't remember what I said, but basically this is the most psychotic thing agents are doing today, right? So if that was the hook, this is the most psychotic thing agents are doing today, what is it? And then this is what they're all saying, don't say that, here's why, right? That was my belief, don't say that. I think it's terrible advice. But I wanna come out with some really divisive way to say that Maybe you don't use psychotic, but you say what everybody's saying is wrong, here's why, right? Be the contrarian. I'm often the contrarian on, on a lot of point of views because what's that gonna do? That's gonna create a whole bunch of comments in the comments section. Everybody's gonna debate that. I wanna start a debate. Even if I'm not even taking a side, I wanna, I wanna say it in a way where everybody else is gonna debate. They may think I'm on one side or the other. I don't care, right? That's what the great politicians do, right? Just say something crazy, let everybody else battle it out. <laughs> so when you know you're gonna have the, the hook, look right into the camera, deliver it with confidence, but have a formula for your long form content that you can repeat over and over and over again.